Welcome, welcome. If you are here in person in the fellowship hall or if you are watching online, we just want to say thank you for joining us. It is an honor that you would choose to be here with us. I'm Michaela and I am the student ministries pastor here at EPA at Elmira Assembly. And yeah, I am going to be I'm going to be bringing the word today and it is an honor to stand here and to to share what God has put on my heart today. So, the message I entitled, "What are you wearing?" which may sound like a silly sermon. Why does it matter? Why does it matter what we wear? We can come here. You're welcome to come here in sweats if you want. Like, that'd be nice. Um, But you can wear whatever you want, except this message is going to get into why, why and what we are called to wear by God. So to start off with, I just want to ask anyone, have you ever met a kid that has put on a costume and refused to take it off? If you haven't actually met one, have you seen funny videos of a kid who just like refuses to take it off? Like they won't get in the bath. They just absolutely refuse because this costume like becomes part of who they are and they just own it. They'll put up a fight for for showering. They'll wear it for a week and then you have to put it in the wash and they just, they aren't about it. They just, they kick and scream just, just to put up a fight because they own this costume. This kid actually becomes Spider-Man and owns everything that that suit entails. You swear that you look at them and they could climb walls and they could spin webs and they know that they can. Their entire persona changes the second that they put on that outfit. One outfit gives them the confidence and the strength needed to defeat the bad guys. So look out for that brand new lamp in your living room because nothing is coming in their way because now they are Spider-Man. We should desire this when it comes to the armor of God. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We should desire to put up a fight to take off the armor, not just to put it on. We need to own it. We need to have our entire persona change because we are so confident in the, what the armor of God does for us that we don't want to take it off. So we're going to read today in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. If you want to turn there, if you have a Bible or your phone. We're going to read it. I'm going to read from my Bible. So Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as your shoes, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit and with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So that is the scripture. Basically, it starts off and it goes through and it tells us that we are standing against an enemy. There is an enemy in our way, and it, it is true. It's not just a future enemy. It's not just a future evil. It's not just end times, but it says present. This is a present evil that we are facing. It talks about Satan, rulers, authorities, powers, forces of evil in this present darkness. This is actually a real battle that we are facing right now, today. Our challenges are real. It goes on to talk about the whole armor of God. So it lists every piece of armor, there's six. It lists them and it lists their purpose. But another word for whole is complete. So that means that every piece of armor needs to be fastened on us in order for it to be fully effective. He equips us with his strength when we prepare ourselves. We don't have to create the armor. The armor was already created. All we have to do is step into it and put it on. And we do that by preparing ourselves. It's literally God's weaponry. His weaponry he gives and made available to us, which is crazy to think about, that he would would literally give me and you the armor that he uses. It goes on, at the end, it talks about prayer and the importance of prayer, how it's essential in keeping us equipped for battle. Merkel says, Paul is saying that the means by which believers stand firm is prayer. 
We need prayer to keep this armor effective because prayer, it says pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. We are to be praying. The first point I kind of want to make about the armor of God is that this armor of God is actually for everyone. I think oftentimes we can be like, oh, this armor is like a great lesson for Sunday school. This is great. Teach the kids that. That's awesome. We treat it kind of like a plastic set of play armor that we can put on whenever we play dress up, but that it's not actually important or applicable in our lives right now today. But it is significant. It actually is armor that we are to be wearing every single day of our lives because it is effective. If it weren't effective, God wouldn't tell us to put it on in the first place because he wouldn't want us to stand defenseless. So why do we stand defenseless? We fail to recognize that the older we get, the more desperately we need this armor in our lives and on us. It's not just for kids. It's for me and you. Or if we recognize it and we know the importance of it, we'll treat it as an as-needed basis. So we'll play dress up, we'll put on it when we need it, or like we feel threatened, we feel attacked. In the moment, we'll like, we'll choose one piece. Okay, this one will protect me right now. I'll put this one on because I need this one. I need the sword of the spirit, or I need the breastplate of righteousness. But we don't have enough time to put it on before we actually need it for it to be effective. If we were in the line of gunfire and we chose, we didn't have our gear on and we're in the line of gunfire, like, What piece are you going to pick up? What is going to keep you? What are you going to hide behind? Whatever it is, it's not going to be as effective of having worn your vest already, wearing the Kevlar that you need to keep protected. So choose wisely whatever you put on unless you're going to choose to wear every single piece of it. The second point I kind of want to draw on is to stand up and get dressed. So Bound says the devil's easiest target is a sleepy Christian. That's really convicting. (laughs) A sleepy Christian is just an easy target. Oftentimes, it's not even a target at all because you're, you're asleep, so why bother? You're already distracted enough that it doesn't matter to, to even attack. Are we sleepy? Are we distracted? Are we distant or lacking desire? Our best defense is to actually be prepared for an attack. Satan's schemes against us, but these schemes aren't things that we can actually see with a v- visible eye. We don't see him scheming against us. So how will we know what attack is coming next and what piece of equipment we need? We won't. That's the short answer. We won't. We need to be equipped for those moments. So don't be exposed in the first place. Get dressed. Have you ever had a moment where you're like, you're just lounging at home, you're in your pajamas, it's like past noon, and and you know what happens. Like Those are always the times without a doubt that you get a knock on the door. You like, literally, you stop, you panic, you think through your head, you're like, okay, now what? Um, Do I have time to run and get clothes on and then come to the door, is that too awkward? Or is it less awkward if I just answer the door in my pajamas and try explaining myself out of this situation? Like, I don't know. We've all had it, maybe it's in-laws, maybe it's parents, maybe it's like, you never know who's gonna show up at your door at that moment that you're just like chilling in your jammies. We need to actually be prepared because if we're prepared in the first place, then we don't have to face those moments unprepared. Our power to stand firm and fight comes through a genuine relationship with Christ. It talks, the spiritual armor lists that they're for truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the spirit. All things that we need to be secure in in order to keep us against attacks. We can attain none of these apart from God, and we can actually create none of these. The coolest part is that, like, we don't have to make them. All we have to do is put it on. God created them and gives them to us freely. It's not even at a cost. But we just need to choose to stand up and put them on. We need to stand firm. It actually says in this scripture, it talks about standing more than three times. It says, withstand, to stand, or stand. He's really driving this point. Paul's really driving this point to stand up. So are we standing up and are we getting ready and are we equipping ourselves with the armor of God? What do we wear then? The armor of God, we know that. But why armor? A quick little history lesson which I find really interesting is that Paul wrote this. So during this time, it was common for Roman soldiers to just wander around in their armor. It was a common sight. They would see, they'd walk down the town, down streets, 
and they would see a soldier just already dressed. It's not that they were necessarily in battle or there was necessarily even a purpose for them. So this analogy that Paul used for this context would be easy for them to understand because they saw it every day. We don't necessarily see, we're very, very blessed in Canada. We don't necessarily see people in, in gear, in armor every day of our lives. So it may not be the easiest analogy for us to understand, but for sake of us understanding, we have police officers here. So they, police officers, are always in, they're always dressed on duty. They have their belt, maybe their vest, their shoes, hat, gun, baton. They have their gear. When they are on duty, they are dressed. It's not really an option. They're equipped for perceived threats. Most days, they probably don't even need any of their armor, or their gear, sorry, but they are dressed as though they would need every piece. We need to wear every piece every day of our lives because if not, we stand defenseless. We're expre expected to dress ourselves with the armor of God in truth, in righteousness, in peace, in faith, in salvation, and in the spirit. So what are these pieces of armor? What do they mean? We're going to go through quickly the belt of truth. What is truth? What is true anymore? Social media is actually set for algorithms to show you what you want to see. News stations show different things. A lot of the time it's not even entirely true. Countries don't agree. Political parties can't agree. Governments can't agree. There's this whole idea of my truth now. My truth. What is my truth? And it's widely accepted. My truth is accepted by people, but yet your truth is accepted by people. So what's the truth? How do we figure out the truth? Anders says, accepting the truth of the Bible and choosing to follow it with integrity. Truth is the word of God. The word of God is true. Everything that God offers us is true, and that's what we should be turning to for truth. And then the breastplate, bless, <laughs> breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? It's kind of like a funny concept. Strong's Dictionary says, integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking or acting, or the way in which man may attain a state approved by God. So basically, in a nutshell, righteousness is living right according to God. That is what righteousness is. So how do we attain that? So that's a really, really tall ask, and the only one who's ever fully attained it is Jesus. But we're to strive for that. We need to strive to live right according to what God says for us. Jesus did it, and now he sits at the right hand of God. There is favor in living right according to God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We need to seek God to become more like him, to live right according to him. Next is the, the, our feet fitted with the gospel of peace. So the gospel is essentially the good news of Christ. It's the grace of God through salvation in Christ. So the gospel of peace then, peace is exemption from rage and havoc of war. These are extreme contrasts. Havoc of war and peace. How do we have both simultaneously? The only way is through Christ, through the gospel of peace. We receive peace through him. And the good news of the gospel is the only thing that carries us with hope and peace into eternity. Good shoes can make all of the difference. Then there's the shield of faith. I found this one like the most interesting in my studies about each piece of armor. This shield is like four and a half feet tall. I'm five six, so probably around here. Four and a half feet tall by two and a half feet wide, and it's actually made of wood. And then on top of that, there's canvas and leather and it's reinforced top and bottom with steel. And then the outside edges are kind of curved so that you have a little bit of protection on your sides, but not, not a lot. It is a massive shield that was designed with intention because when you dipped the canvas or leather in water, it could actually extinguish flaming arrows that are coming at you. This shield, this faith, is actually designed with purpose to protect us. This is one of the key pieces of armor in their protection because it could cover, 
head to toe, their entire body. But they had to lift it up. They had to walk with it. They had to, it was a burden. It was heavy, but it was the most useful and effective. Faith, our faith does the same because it gives us the confidence that we're protected, that nothing is going to get in our way, nothing is going to harm us. The Oxford definition of faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. That's kind of convicting. It's like complete trust. Do we fully and wholeheartedly trust God that we're going to be okay, that we're safe? Trusting in God's promises. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. It got me thinking, we walk by faith, not sight. If I'm behind a four and a half foot tall shield and I'm hiding, I can't see. I can't see what's ahead of me. I just have faith that this shield in front of me that stands before me is actually going to do its purpose and protect me. I can't actually see. I'm not walking by sight. I'm walking by faith. Are we doing that in our spiritual lives? Are we trusting the shield that is before us that is Christ that can protect us? We walk by faith in God, and he provides the protection that we need. Merkel says, what shields believers is their confidence and trust in God. We are shielded by our confidence and trust in God. And in the Bible, in in Jesus' time on earth, we see countless stories of faith being rewarded. There's the woman who touches his robe. There's the woman's daughter that was oppressed by demons. Or there's the boy with the demon. In each of these stories, it says by Jesus' mouth, his words, that we can trust in, like, your faith has been rewarded. Your faith is what rewarded you. Our faith protects us, and we get reward through it. Then there's the helmet of salvation. If you took a blow to the head, the odds of you surviving that are very, very slim. The helmet of salvation, that's like the first thing you put on, your helmet of salvation. Without the helmet of salvation, none of the other armor is as necessary, technically, really, Because if you take a blow to the head, then that's probably it. We're defenseless apart from our salvation through grace, through the grace of God and Christ's sacrifice for us. We need to keep our mind on eternity. Yes, salvation is typically a one-time occurrence, but we need to keep our minds fixated on eternity and the reward that we receive there because we've already won. The fact that we've already won means all we have to do is stand All we have to do is stand firm because the victory is already ours through Christ. We need to remind ourselves of this truth, though. And then the last piece of armor is the sword of the Spirit. So the sword is actually the only offensive and defensive piece of armor. Everything else is an offensive piece. But the sword of the Spirit is the only thing that we're given to attack. It's actually a sword. They believe that it's a shorter sword made for close proximity fights but it's only as useful as the amount of the word that we know. If we don't know much of the word, if we don't know much of... I'm going to drop my papers and that's okay. If we don't know much of this, then we can't actually use it. It's not effective. If I'm being attacked, then... And I don't don't have anything in this memorized, then I I can't even jab with it. I need to know more because with each thing that I know is like a jab I can take to protect myself. We actually need to be in the word and know what is in the word because that is our only defense. We don't want to be in a close contact battle without knowing the word of God because we will fail every time. And our armor can only withstand so much without a defense. And it's all made effective through the Holy Spirit. So we need to use the scripture to fend off the enemy. Jesus did this in the temp- his temptation in the wilderness. Satan actually used scripture. Like he quoted scripture. He quoted it like word for word. Not correctly out of context, but he knew it word for word. In a message one time, Ryan McDermott said, does Satan know the word of God better than I do? Uh, I, when I heard that, I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> But does he? Does Satan know the word of God better than I do? Like, he's quoting it. He's quoting it for our harm, but he knows it. Do I know it enough to be able to withstand and call out that it's incorrect? 
He did this even at the very, very beginning with Eve. Tried to quote, he literally, he tried to quote God and what he said, the first call to them. But Eve didn't know. Eve didn't know and she couldn't withstand that because she didn't know. Are we going to be that or are we going to be Jesus who calls it out? We need to be in the word in order to do that, though. It's our only defense, and without it, our, arm, our armor is only going to hold up so long. The last point I want to make is that we need to stand together. The armor actually doesn't necessarily mention anything for our backs. Our backs are pretty much just wide open. I mean, when you're in battle, you're often not going to have your enemy behind you. That's just poor tactics. But the enemy wants to be behind you because he knows you're weak. We need to have each other's backs because they are defenseless. There's strength in numbers. There's actually this battle formation called testudo, which is like a turtle formation. So imagine these four and a half feet tall shields by two and a half feet wide. If you're like really feeling the attack, then there's this form that you can go into to really protect yourselves. They would have one row stand with their shields up, upright, up and down, and then they'd have another row behind them with their shield up above their heads, essentially forming a turtle shell. And this shell could actually have the strength to really genuinely protect them because not only are they covered in front, they're covered from above, and if necessary, they could form one behind and on the sides and actually have shelter. They n understood that there was power and effectiveness in being together and in formation. The only problem with this is that when you're in a head-to-head -head battle and you take this formation, you have to move in unison. Because as soon as one person steps out of that unison, then you're, you're defenseless again. We need to walk in step with each other, with other believers, because that is when we have the most strength. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 says, And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two with, will withstand him. A threefold, threefold cord is not quickly broken. There is power in us standing together. There is so much power in me and you coming together and building each other up and standing firm with each other. Not only that, but there's also power in the fact that Others may have a different vantage point and actually be able to see attacks that you're facing. I only see so much, but if someone's standing beside me, like my peripheral can't see Pastor Derek. But if someone's standing beside me, they could see him. Not that he's going to attack me. He never would. <laughs> but, but we have more vantage points when we stand together because other people can call out things that we don't actually have the power to recognize for ourselves. Even in the story of Moses where he sent out the 12 spies to go survey the promised land in Numbers chapter 13, if, they, if Moses didn't send out that many people, they may have all come back and said, oh no, we, no, we can't, they're too big, they're too scary, we actually are not going to defeat them. But yet Caleb came back and had a different report, like, oh yeah, like, the land is very fruitful, like, we need to go, we need to take it over, we can do this. So Caleb and Joshua, and then Moses and Aaron were leading but had they not gone out in that many people, they never would have seeked the reward. We need to stand firm together with each other because there's so much more strength in numbers. We need to be surrounded by a community that is willing to build us up and stand together and fight with us when necessary. So in closing, I just want to remind us to, to stay awake and on watch. Be attentive and ready. Because when we're actually already ready, there's so much less work when we are being attacked because we can stand in faith that we are protected. And this armor is for every single one of us. It is designed for us with an intention, with purpose. So get up and get dressed. Get, get your armor on. Get protected. If you need to this week, actually like read those six pieces of armor and understand what they're for and what they're designed for and how you can attain that. Put on the armor and stand together because we're so much more powerful and effective when we're actually for each other and not against each other. With that, I'm going to close in prayer. God, I just, I thank you that you provide protection for us. 
God, we don't need to do anything. We don't need to create this armor. We don't need to create means to, means to protect ourselves that it already exists. God, I pray that this week each of us looks at this again and is reminded of our need, our weakness apart from this armor, God, apart from you. God, I pray that we have more faith, that we desire to live in right standing with you, God. God, I pray that each piece of armor is put on to us and that we can stand firm and stand firm together. God, I thank you that you are for us and not against us. God, we just honor you and praise you and thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.